Okay, welcome back everyone. We're now going to have a concept uh, presentation by Lucia Hindorf, Program Director at NHGRI. There are actually three concepts being presented under CSER II, so there'll be uh, three separate discussions, discussion, vote, discussion, vote, discussion, vote. And then we'll have a discussion vote on the investigator initiated, initiated uh, program announcement, which has a set aside of funds associated with it. Therefore, a vote is required on that as well. So, Lucia. Great, thanks. Before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of several of the CSER staff, particularly Jean, Dave, and especially Carolyn, and our outstanding analysts, Ellie and Alex, in the back. Okay. Can everybody hear me? All right, across the spectrum of genomics, a central feature of NHGRI programs is that the human genome has brought people together to answer critical questions about how the genome works, and then to ask even better questions than the ones we started out with. In the past several years, NHGRI has established programs to make inroads in understanding how genomic information can be used to improve human health by applying genomic technologies to healthcare settings. NHGRI's first major foray into clinical sequencing occurred in 2011 when the Clinical Sequencing Exploratory Research, or CSER, program was funded to explore the use of genome sequencing in clinical care and identify challenges and opportunities across, across um, varied clinical contexts. Dan Roden's presentation nicely described the study organization and recent progress, but just to remind you, a key characteristic of CSER was its three-part focus on, first, a clinical genomic study in which patients and practitioners were recruited. Second, a, a second project with generated, analyzed, and interpreted sequencing data. And a third project focusing on return of results and in which there was an overarching focus on the ethical, legal, and psychosocial implications, which I will abbreviate as LC. Throughout CSER, these parts worked in an integrated way. From the beginning, CSER was organized around a consortium model with integrated, highly coordinated efforts, as symbolized by this formal garden. Sites were able to learn from one another as they implemented clinical workflows for genome sequencing. And over the course of several years of working together, they've written papers that have helped establish the evidence base for clinical utility, including a number of best practices and recommendation in areas as diverse as pediatrics, tumor, uh, electronic health record integration, and variant interpretation, including a number of professional society guidelines that you heard about in Dan's talk. It's also true that when CSER was initially envisioned, the many flowers bloom approach was also fundamental. So within the basic project structure that I described, Investigators had the flexibility to refine their site's focus on clinical settings, on research methods and approaches, and on site-specific expertise that could drive innovation in key areas. Going forward for CSER II, we will likely benefit from a balance of both approaches. In Dan's talk, we heard a number of key recommendations from the CSER and Beyond workshop last fall, and it's worth taking a step back to juxtapose them with the NHGRI strategic plan, which shows an increase in density around the science of medicine and effectiveness of healthcare domains through 2020 and beyond. So as part of the advancing of science medicine domain, we heard recommendations to increase participant diversity along eth ethnic, racial, socioeconomic, and underserved lines, and to continue to focus on interactions among patients, family members, practitioners, and clinical labs. As part of the effectiveness of healthcare domain, recommendations included assessing the clinical utility of genomic sequencing. In the setting where clinical utility is still being assessed, we need a shared evidence base in a similar way that uh, the relevance of genomic medicine to different healthcare settings beyond academic medical center, uh, settings was also raised as a recommendation. And as CSER um, data have been used to inform and refine uh, practice guidelines and variant interpretation, um, to continue to use stakeholder input to inform um, and, and refine future clinical sequencing data is important. These um, recommendations form the basis for the three proposed aims of CSER II. The first aim is to generate evidence to determine the clinical utility of genome sequencing. The second aim is to research the critical interactions among patients, family members, health practitioners, and clinical laboratories. And the third aim is to investigate the feasibility of exchanging genomic, clinical, and healthcare utilization data within an existing healthcare system. So let's take the first aim. Clinical utility, as defined by ACNG and others, is the likelihood that genomic intervention leads to improved health outcomes. Broadly speaking, this includes diagnosis, treatment, management, or disease prevention that will benefit a patient or his or her family members. Assessing clinical utility is inherent to understanding how gen genomic information benefits human health and is thus already an indirect focus of many NHGRI programs. However, there is not yet consensus on what measures of clinical utility to use for decision making. 
Decisions on reimbursement, for example, tend to use a much narrower definition that do not rely as much on the value of a diagnosis. So we're not just talking about an evidence gap, but a how we think about evidence gap. A second aim of CSER relates to identifying research opportunities at the point of the clinical encounter, where patients and family members, practitioners, and clinical laboratories intersect. A number of research opportunities could be envisioned um, in this space, and I'm just going to list three as, as exemplars. There are um, many, many more. For example, um, the patient and family measured, uh, family-centered measures of utility, exchange of phenotype information, variant interpretation and disclosure, and characterizing this cascade of genomic information. This latter finding refers to the, um, um, the process that occurs when a genomic finding ends a diagnostic odyssey. It can often begin a cascade of additional medical and other consequences as well as implications for um, family members. I would like to note that these topics leave room for flexibility for investigators to propose research topics that are relevant to their particular clinical setting. Again, tying back to the balance between the consortium and site-specific eff efforts. We imagine, as was true for CSER 1, that the rich integration of ELSI will continue throughout each of these domains. Um, as I've mentioned, um, promoting interactions among these groups is critical, but so is doing so in the context of the healthcare system. Related to the healthcare system, a third aim of CSER 2 will be to investigate the feasibility of exchanging genomic, clinical, and healthcare utilization data within existing healthcare systems. This is an area in which the spectrum of clinical settings across CSER, for example, in healthy and diseased individuals or in pediatric and adult populations or in academic or community settings, those um, differences lend themselves well to an effectiveness approach, which um, study real-world settings comparing, compared to an efficacy approach under highly controlled or idealized research settings. Um, this is really to get around the problem or to, to help ameliorate the problem of having silos. So genomic data are often siloed from EHR data as was described in the joint paper between CSER and eMERGE. Clinical data can be siloed in research databases or patient registries. And healthcare utilization data are often siloed in, in um, systems related to billing. Data exchange to unify data across silos is important to being able to accomplish the first two aims of CSER. For CSER two, that we propose that this be implemented iteratively within an individual healthcare system. The idea being that a genomic finding um, that, that um, shows some sort of benefit for patient care might be useful for other subsequent patients. But this works best if the system can iteratively incorporate and learn from that initial information. Many of the challenges of implementing this model um, are likely to be institution specific, so that's why we're proposing this aim for feasibility. Um, use of existing standards, however, and common standards across uh, consortium sites will be strongly encouraged wherever possible. To enhance the applicability of evidence that CSER II generates beyond um, um, specialized medical centers, we are going to rely on two key components. The first we've heard a lot about um, today, um, it, it has to do with the topic of diversity. So here we um, will rely on increasing participant diversity as well as including clinical side settings outside academic medical centers. CSER II will deliberately engage stakeholders such as professional societies, payers, regulatory agencies, and patients all of whom have a stake in the type of evidence that CSER will be generating. Such buy-in will generate evidence and best practices with a high likelihood of adoption, as well as keep CSER II outward-looking and cognizant of other efforts. So if the program is successful, we will be able to bridge the how we think about evidence gap and say that we did this work intentionally, including diverse individuals and stakeholders. Okay, so now, so now we've covered the why of CSER. Let me transition to how we plan to do this work. So we're proposing a series of three RFAs um, and also a, a program announcement with set aside, which, as Rudy mentioned, we'll talk about after the RFAs. The clinical site RFAs collectively um, have similar goals and will study 10,000 diverse patients across CSER II. Each site will recruit, sequence, and disclose results to patients within the context of the healthcare setting. Um, we would expect sites to include comparison genomic modalities to evaluate the clinical utility aim, for example, comparing whole exome to gene panels. Existing data would be permitted with caveats, so for example, existing sequence data um, could be included as long as investigators could demonstrate um, that they were addressing all three aims. This might be also an opportunity to part encourage partnerships with other existing resources um, that have diverse data, which will be important in just a minute. Um, it will be crucial to establish multidisciplinary teams as well, so investigators will be expected to include a broad degree of research and clinical expertise to integrate LC throughout the three aims to um, foster a collaborative environment where idea and data exchange works well within sites as well as across them. 
and then also um, sites will, will um, propose ideas for stakeholder engagement, whether that's having stakeholders as co-investigators on grants or um, as members of um, advisory panels or steering committee meetings or other ideas that uh, investigators may have. Okay, so um, we've heard a lot about diversity today, and, and I want to be clear about what I mean about participant diversity. Um, for this presentation, I'll be referring to race or ethnic, socioeconomic, or underserved distinctions. Each site will be, well, each site will be um, addressing one or more diversity-focused research aim in these subgroups. For example, looking at differences among them in the disclosure and interpretation of genomic results, differences in disease presentation, diagnosis, and healthcare implications, uh, novel methods for healthcare delivery in, in um, challenging or underserved populations, and other relevant areas. We're proposing two RFAs with different thresholds for the per percentage of participants um, from diverse populations. The first RFA, which we're referring to as general clinical sites, will be strongly encouraged to recruit 25% or more of their participants from diverse populations. The clinical sites with enhanced diversity have a higher threshold of 60% or more. And the rationale for splitting out the two RFAs um, is twofold. First, it gives us some, the flexibility to assign a separate review panel for the enhanced diversity sites. And it also um, addresses what we know to be logistical and practical challenges in recruiting and retaining individuals in challenging settings. And so the second RFA um, is proposed to have an up to a 20% increased budget cap to uh, help investigators plan for those challenges. Okay, to get the sense of what is possible in a program of the size that we're proposing, we did some thought experiments and power calculations for individual sites. So keep in mind that part of the goal of CSER II is actually to define and assess relevant measures of clinical utility, so the exact measures are not known. These are just the examples. So if you take the 10,000 participants that are assumed across CSER II and you divide by nine, which is the midpoint of the range of the number of sites we're proposing, you get 1,100 participants per site. Um, assume that they would come from a, a spectrum of real-world clinical settings, um, adults and children, for example, um, and that each site would be well-poised to look at disease-specific analyses or site-specific measures. So, for example, a site could look at the difference in disease diagnostic rates comparing whole genome sequencing to standard of care. So with 1,100 participants, there would be 80% power to detect a comparison of 25% in whole genome, which is a diagnostic rate that's seen in CSER and elsewhere compared to 18% or lower in standard of care. So that's an absolute difference of at least 7%. A site could look at whether the actionable finding rate differed between whole exome and panel testing. So um, it would be powered to detect a comparison of 45% in whole exome, which was the rate from the paper that Eric mentioned this morning, compared to 37% or lower in panel testing. So that's an absolute difference of 8% um, or more. So I want to stress the importance of doing this across multiple sites. We could then compare each of these kinds of um, analyses across, for example, adults and children, across disease A, disease B, um, different ethnic groups, um, et cetera. We also looked at what would be possible in a sample size of 10,000 participants across the consortium. So um, recognize that sites might may be comparing different sequencing approaches, um, but we could aggregate analyses across clinical settings um, and, and even among subgroups. Um, such outcomes might include rare outcomes that could be evaluated consortium-wide, as well as the standardized or aggregated measures of clinical utility that I mentioned before. So 10,000 allows us um, to, for example, look at the secondary finding rate um, in whole exome compared to standard of care. And here, um, 10,000 participants will be powered to detect a comparison of 4% in whole exome compared to 3% or lower in standard of care, so an absolute difference of 1% or more. We could also look at subgroups. So if you wanted to look at the actionable finding rate, and how that compared in adults versus children with whole exome sequencing, this sample size would be powered to detect a comparison of 45% in adults compared to 41% in children. So that's an absolute difference of 4% uh, or more. Speaking along the lines of CSER II wide opportunities, one key component of this, of this is going to be this uh, coordinating center or the CC. We're going to continue to need scientific and administrative coordination to facilitate CSER II efforts, for example, aggregating data to disseminate resources and best practices, to respond um, to opportunities to which CSER II could uniquely contribute. So it's hard to know about them in advance, but they could include things like professional society guidelines that are either being developed or have just come out. Um, coordination of stakeholder engagement will be crucial. Um, and this is not to displace what any of the individual sites would do, but for example, if there were multiple cancer sites, it might make sense to coordinate outreach to AACR or, or ASCO um, in, a, in a more central way across sites. And then finally, we would rely on the CC to organize steering committee meetings, working group, and stakeholder meetings. Okay, so now let's take a look at the, um, the table again with the proposed budget. So 
for the general clinical sites, we're proposing an annual budget that's about the same as what the current Caesar sites are being funded at. The enhanced diversity sites, as I mentioned, would be um, um, given up to a 20% increase budget cap. And the coordinating center is proposed for um, a slightly higher budget than they have now to account for um, increases in um, stakeholder um, engagement, increased expectations for stakeholder engagement, as well as an additional consortium meeting. Um, I should note that we are seeking support from other ICs uh, for co-funding co and have had some very encouraging discussions. So where possible, we, we hope to um, have some buy-in from other institutes. Okay, so um, one other thing that I want to talk about is we've discussed the why and the how of CSER II, so I want to take a step back and see how CSER II fits in with the landscape of other genomic medicine programs. So the implementation of genomic medicine has a number of bottlenecks where challenges and opportunities across fields lend themselves well to a consortium approach, so you see some of them here. As I've described today, um, the primary focus of CSER II is in determining clinical utility with a lesser emphasis in these other areas that you see here. However, genomic medicine program, other genomic medicine programs have a unique primary focus um, in each of these other categories. So for example, ClinGen focuses on variant curation to speed the identification of clinically relevant variants. BUDN focuses on diagnosis and clinical evaluation to end the diagnostic odyssey. IGNITE focuses on clinical decision support and dissemination um, in tests with established, genomic, uh, established clinical utility. INSIGHT focuses on newborn and pediatric populations. And EMERGE um, has a unique focus on estimating penetrance um, and also a, a unique focus on EHR-derived phenotypes. These programs are also doing cross-cutting work in a complementary yet distinct way. One feature of such complementary programs is synergy without duplication. So for example, CSER's primary focus will be assessing the clinical utility of genomic sequencing more broadly, whereas EMERGE is focusing on the penetrance and clinical consequences of actionable genomic variants. CSER II will focus on genomic tests with clinical utility yet to be established, as I mentioned, compared to IGNITE, which is focusing on genomic tests with established clinical utility. CSER II will focus on clinical sequencing in adult and pediatric patients, compared to NSITE, which is focused on sequencing in newborns. And then a central feature of CSER II will be understanding and managing the diagnostic uncertainty and the uncertainty in clinical utility, whereas UDN has a much more um, primary focus on ending the diagnostic odyssey. Okay, so now we've, we've kind of um, taken a look at why and how of CSER and looked at how CSER fits in with the other genomic medicine um, programs. I'm going to show the three CSER two aims here briefly before we move on to our discussion. Um, we do have a number of questions um, or topics for discussion where we'd like council input. The first, which will surprise um, nobody, is the definition of diversity. So um, historically, um, NHGRI has focused on race and ethnicity um, to, um, to broaden inclusion in our programs should we take this opportunity and um, consider a broader definition that includes low SES and underserved populations. Second, the data exchange aim is currently phrased as a, a pilot or feasibility aim should we have stronger expectations or say more about um, expecting common standards. And then I think general feedback on the balance between site-specific and consortium goals would be welcome. So we have four discussants assigned to lead off the conversation, um, Bob, Dan, Shanita, and Lucilla. Uh, so why don't we start with Bob? So we, we've had prior, prior conversations and the current um, document and then also the slides that Lucia just showed I think re reflects the, to a large extent um, the minor changes that resulted from our conversations. So fundamentally, I think CSER itself has been a successful program and it makes sense to continue uh, the clinical uh, sequencing exploratory, uh, whether, you, whether you want to call it exploratory anymore or you want to change that name a little bit. I don't know, I like CSER, it just has a certain <clears throat> ring to it, but whatever. Um, I think the key issues here are ones that I think Lucia has done a good job of addressing, which is how does CSER fit in with all the other uh, acronyms, the IGNITES and the EMERGES and the INSIGHTS and the, and the ClinGens and all that, uh, all, all that, that alphabet soup. And um, I, I think that there is an attempt to strike a balance between um, synergy and overlap, uh, synergy and redundancy. I think you have to have a little bit of redundancy in order to have any synergy at all. But I think that the synergy is greatly enhanced compared to the redundancy. So I, I, I think you've said it about just about the right way. Um, the other issue uh, you, you mentioned is about um, data exchange. 
And I, I, I fully recognize that it is so much easier. It, it, it's hard enough, at least I have from personal experience, it's hard enough trying to get your own institution to do certain things when it comes to clinical studies, particularly when it's involving effectiveness research, in other words, real life settings as opposed to um, artificial um, efficacy kinds of research, and then expanding that to make multiple institutions try to hone to some basic goal, I think is much, much harder. So I, I do recognize that there is, I think there is value, and if I were a Caesar II investigator, I would want to um, be able to focus on my institution, which is hard enough to get anything done. That said, I think having uh, n not a pilot or feasibility, but an actual commitment to interoperability and standards, I think is, a, is, is absolutely essential if this is ever going to become more than just a little boutique uh, effort uh, in a small number of institutions. Um, and then finally, in terms of uh, diversity definition, um, I think my, my, main, my main comment there is that there's a lot of people who are underserved for reasons that have not to do with race, race or ethnicity per se, but have a lot to do with geographic um, dispersion and also um, educational and economic, so more of the SES. And so I would encourage um, uh, um, continue, um, containing that or combining that into a diversity definition along with race and ethnicity, which is obviously a major, really, really important uh, area. And then actually, as you were speaking, Lucia, something I didn't bring up before, but it just occurred to me is that um, somewhere in here, some investigation of the obstacle of fear about insurability probably should somehow play a role in here. Um, despite Jenna, there's mm -hmm. still uh, a fairly high worrisome co comment about life insurance and other sorts of insurance that Jenna doesn't really cover. And I know Robert Green has told me that in some of his work, he's been just shocked at how often worries about being able to get life insurance has entered into decisions about wanting to participate, not just in research, but also to even participate in any kind of um, clinical uh, utility using sequencing that's going to unveil things that you can't predict before you do it. So I just thought I would add that as a little, maybe a little tick to put in. But I mean, all, all in all, um, um, I'm, I'm, I think the concept is a, is a good one. I, I think it's something that needs to be done, it should be done, um, and will synergize with the other programs. Okay, thanks. Um, should we move on to uh, Dan? I, I really have very little to add. The, I'll, I'll make um, two points. One is that uh, uh, when I first started to think about where Caesar belongs, uh, first joined their advisory board and where Caesar belongs, I thought, well, it's, it really sort of seems to me to be almost congruent with eMERGE, and that is absolutely not the case. Uh, CSER is the, the, the place where the healthcare system interacting with an individual patient starts to sort of take legs, whereas eMERGE is top-down. And the only place where people think about, you know, what, do, what do individual subjects, how do individual subjects react to this kind of information? In terms of emotional reaction as well as healthcare re reactions, is is in this initiative. So I've, I'm, I've I've become a pretty strong proponent of this um, through watching them and so through thinking about the, the problem. The second uh, point I'd make is something that uh, uh, Val raised uh, in an earlier discussion, and that is the uh, the idea that the the field is now mature enough. Five years ago, ten years ago, the idea of of doing any kind of sequencing in a large number of people and making head or tail of it was something that needed to be driven by some central authority because nobody really sort of had any sense of how that would work. Um, I think we're now in a position where there's, where the, the sequencing is not the, the, the major challenge, still is a challenge, but the application of it becomes a challenge. And so I, I think to confine ourselves to thinking that everybody at NHGRI has the, on, has the best ideas or the only ideas and that large investigator community out there can contribute some really unique things is a mistake. So, so I would uh, I would uh, I would argue strongly in favor of a, of a the 
investigator initiated the police investigation. Write it down. Um, how about Shanita? Um, so I think the concepts that you presented them are really responsive to the issues that um, that were identified with diversity and the ongoing CESA program. So I think that's a really great, the approach you, um, your team has developed is really um, responsive to that. I'm glad to see it included in there. I would also support a more inclusive definition of diversity, one that considers um, race, ethnicity, geography, um, as well as other characteristics. Um, and I think, you know, going back to the issue of diversity, I really am supportive of the um, the inclusion of diversity centers. And I just wondered um, what your thoughts were about ensuring that there is sufficient interaction between the diversity centers and the other centers. I think that's a great question, and it's, it's, a, it's a good one because we didn't have, um, oh, you can. No, that's okay. I couldn't tell if we needed to have any two mics to get some feedback, well, but. Yeah, well, I, you can hear me if I, okay, this is better. Um, so um, we do, so okay, so we did, um, we didn't have, I was, was just about to say, so we, we didn't um, have room to get into this in the concept clearance, but we do imagine them as, as being essentially the same sites, except for the distinction of the 25% and the 60%. Other than that, the goals would be the same. Um, so they would be very complementary. I wouldn't see any other distinction um, between them. So they would, they would work together. Um, let's see, Lucilla? Yeah, uh, as for, for the questions, I would say all of the above. They are all important, uh, and I would support all of them. The, the one thing that is still a little confusing to me is um, that slide that Emerge is not anymore dealing with clinical decision support, uh, because I, th I, I think it, it does to, to a, a large extent still. And I think that's the major strength of synergizing because to my understanding, Emerge is <coughs> converging to a standard in terms of electronic health records um, and so on. So, so it would be better to have uh, both follow the same standard uh, to the extent possible. And then also uh, use the lessons learned in Emerge and, and particularly a clinical decision support is hard, and it's hard to implement on, on the commercial vendor systems that we have out there. But to try to push the envelope towards uh, that direction. Um, as I uh, mentioned before, I think the, the, the secret is how to get the RFA right so that um, the, the um, greater than 25%, 20, greater than 60% is well defined, and there is a rationale for, for um, what's expected in, in, in how it is uh, monitored, because it will be hard to to monitor this over time, right? And, uh, and again, as I mentioned before, I, I think the R01 concept is very important, the investigator initiated, uh, but I would say, you know, that it could be broader than, than what was uh, presented in terms of seemingly too prescriptive and it has to be the variance that the CSER found and, and things like that. So, so those were my main comments. Okay, okay thanks. Um, I take all of those points. I will mention that the, the, um, the figure that I showed um, did show, I think, the primary emphasis on clinical decision support and dissemination for the IGNITE program, but the other programs also have an emphasis in that. I think Emerge would also say that it's doing clinical decision support. CSER from, from even current CSER has a little bit of, yep. of that. Do you want to come? Not in some context. I just think because it's come up a couple times, we are going to have a separate discussion about the investigator initiated. So it's a, you know I don't want to. A couple people have mentioned that, and I just want to point out that we will be discussing that more. Okay. Thanks, Sharon. Um, comments from other council members. Do you want to? So if indeed the two programs are going to be that coordinated, I, I guess I'd still encourage you to reconsider having two RFAs, one with 25% and one with 60%. I just, that's just bothering me as a precedent that the Institute's going to follow. I just don't think that's the way to promote diversity within the study. Um, I, there's just something about it that's bothering me, particularly if we expand the definition of underserved to include 
socioeconomic status, etc. It's just bothering me that we're going to have these two sets of of RFAs, and, and if we did that across every program, I just think it's a slippery slope. So that's one kind, and then I'll be quiet. And then the second is, I actually didn't have many questions until your presentation that your power calculation, and I apologize for clicking on power gauge, it assumed that there was 11,000 people. That, that's, that was across all of CSER, right? And, and I, I doubt if there's a shared single hypothesis and method across every site you're going to do a unified power calculation. I realize that's quibbling, but on the other hand, I, I would just avoid the inclusion of power calculations. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's bad enough that the investigators have to do them in their grants. I, 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 I would hate to see. I would hate to see council um, have to do formal power it's calculations. It's a dangerous with president. More uh, um, I, I will say, though, that so I, I completely take your point about the measures being different. I, I will say in current CSER, for example, the psychosocial outcomes and measures group, even though they're all using different instruments, there are sort of aggregate major measures like, you know, is there is there harm, um, is there patient harm being done, you know, that can be aggregated across. And it was that sort of general um, um, measure that I was referring to. But, yeah, I, I take your point. And then and I think about the, the RFAs, I, I think it's a good point as well. One thing that I, I recalled from our, um, our pre pre um, council kind of uh, concept development discussions was some some individuals I think were concerned that even a single threshold say 60 percent would be challenging um, to me I think there were some concerns that that just might not be feasible um, and you know I, I guess I, I welcome council input on whether that that um, threshold um, you know if we were to pursue a single RFA would be too high you know I, I think that was one of the reasons why we decided to keep them separate was provide an incentive for some studies to go higher. I mean, it, I, I think we could have gone either way. Yeah, I'll be quick, but I, um, I think that it's very laudable that, and I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that people will be able to guarantee that kind of percentage. I also, I just wanted to say, I think this makes very clear um, that you're not talking about ancestry populations here. You're really focusing on disparities populations mm -hmm. and that that's not just race, ethnicity. It includes a number of other features which have been already mentioned. So I think that's awesome as well. I would very much support that. So just to get your thinking on this, there's two ways to handle a question like how do you define diversity? One is to wrestle with it and put it in the RFA and the other is to open it up to the applicants, which gets messy, but you get the best, you get interesting ideas that way. Uh, well, I think it opens up muddying the waters again. And I, I just okay. think, I think you've got a very clear mandate with this, which was not accomplished in Caesar 1. And um, should the, and so I would, I would advocate being even more specific about the kinds of things Jim mentioned, which we had seen as falling up, you know, falling down in our, despite our best efforts. So, I don't know. Sorry. Well, I feel no, really strongly I, about it. I asked the question. <laughs> Somebody else? See, I wanted to comment. You, you, you put something in there about the coordinating center being responsible for helping to disseminate information to um, professional societies and to uh, try to put, bring them on board. I just wanted to add that there are probably two or three other critical bodies that it would be terrific to try to coordinate with. One is the Blue Cross Blue Shield Technology Assessment Group, and the other is the Molecular Diagnostics uh, Tech Assessment Group out of Palmetto, which is one okay. of the contractors for uh, Medicare. Other comments? There's someone coming to the microphone here. Uh, from Child Health. Yeah, oh, sorry. Well, Regina, why don't you identify yourself? Your microphone is not on. Okay. So, hi. Good morning. Uh, afternoon, actually. Um, yes, my name is Regina James, and yes, I was at Child Health, but now actually I'm at the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, and just kind of listening to the discussion around 
diversity definition. Just wanted to kind of put on the table that there is an official diversity definition for NIH, so it doesn't necessarily have to be um, adjusted. Um, but I did want to just share with you just a definition of minority health and health disparities research and education, which is based on the public law, just to kind of keep this in mind as you're thinking about populations and the health. So despite notable progress in the overall health of the nation, there are continuing disparities in the burden of illness and death experienced by African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, Alaska Natives, and Asian Pacific Islanders compared to the U.S. population as a whole. The largest numbers of the medically underserved are white individuals, and many of them have the same health care access problems as do members of minority groups. However, there is a higher proportion of racial and ethnic minorities in the U.S. represented among the medically underserved. And this is based on the public law 106.525. So with this discussion that you're having around focus on race and ethnicity, whether you should or shouldn't, what is the definition of diversity? All those are really spelled out, and I guess the real question is, what is the research question that you're really trying to get at, and not necessarily trying to change the definitions? That's it. Thank you so much. I think we are. Um, so I think we're ready for a vote, and we'll take them one at a time. We need a vote for each one of them. So can I get a motion to approve the concept as defined in the document and explained here by Lucia for the first, the clinical sites? Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. Um, so no further questions. So you don't need any clarification about the other two, right? I heard a full discussion. All right. We're just going to march through them. Huh? So a motion to approve the second concept for the clinical sites focus on diversity uh, participants. A motion to approve. A second. All in favor? Any opposed? the coordinating center motion to approve second all in favor any opposed and any abstaining thank you very much thank you very much all right we'll thank move you. on and to we'll the, do the, 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 the right right